brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Be here. How's everybody else? Good, man. Good. We got uh, Matthew Marcel and Jeremy Anderson on here today, some really close brothers of ours, and it's, uh, it's a blessing to have them on. How you doing, Jeremy? I, if I got any better, man, I don't think I could stand it. And I am truly blessed to be on with you guys tonight. I really am. Hey, man. Thank you, brother. Yes, yeah, so... We also have Matthew. Matthew is a friend of Jeremy and, and myself and Brian. And, and uh, these two have a lot in common. We all do when it comes to the other church fathers and uh, what they believe is what we believe when it comes to um, the doctrine that they all unanimously, unanimously agreed upon. You know, I've said in past shows that there are some small things that they may have had their own opinions about, but for the major doctrines and the, and the deep theological things that they were taught by the apostles, they, the ones that they all unanimous, unanimously agreed upon, we also believe that um, as brothers, and that's what we try to promote and hold to. Um, it is the ancient faith, and today we're going to get into the topic of uh, salvation and the essential need for obedience. And uh, salvation comes in two parts. It is um, by grace through faith, and then part two is what we're going to be expounding on as well. So, um, you know, Matthew, um, actually, I'll start with Jeremy, I forgot. So Jeremy, um, can you give us a little... You know, uh, uh, just a brief overview of, of what the other church believed about salvation and obedience. Well, um, as far as the early church, and when I say the early church, I mean the anti-Nicene church, the first uh, 300 years of Christianity before the Council of Nicaea. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me before, um, why is it important to read the um, early church writings and can we not come up with a a correct view of salvation and Christianity without reading the writings of the early church fathers and my answer to them is always the same and that is yes it is I think it is important um, to learn what they believe so that we can uh, come to a better understanding of what the apostles taught. But you can come up with a correct idea and, you know, sound theology the same way the early church did, simply by following the teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles, taking everything that Jesus said in the red letters, everything that the apostles said in their letters, and just when we read it take it literally understand that jesus was not talking to just the audience that was in front of him nor was he talking to some future people in the millennial reign like um i said that because there are two different schools of theology that teach both of those things one that Jesus was, uh, like in the Sermon on the Mount, he was talking only to the Jews that were there. And then there is another group in the Baptist church that um, teach that the Sermon on the Mount is impossible for us to um, live by today. And therefore, Jesus was teaching how we should live in the millennial reign. Both of those things are completely false. Jesus was giving us the way to live as his followers, um, and that's exactly what the uh, what Jesus taught the apostles, and that's exactly what the apostles taught their disciples, who were the earliest of the early church writers. And then after them, you had the disciples of the apostles' disciples, and so. You can come to a correct view of salvation and Christianity 
just by taking the Bible literally, the New Testament especially, taking it literally, unless it's obviously a parable or, um, you know, speaking symbolically um, the teachings of Jesus, you know, he, he taught in parables, but the reason Jesus taught in parables was exactly what he said to his disciples that um, the common people who did not have the Holy Spirit weren't going to be able to understand the things he taught without the parables. However, we can read the parables and know what he taught. And we can also see exactly what he was teaching from the parables. You know, they aren't, <laughs> they aren't some obscure um, secret teachings that are hard to understand. Um, you know, one that comes to mind that the early church um, really, really leaned on other than, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is John chapter 15. And, you know, John chapter 15 is where Jesus talks about, you know, be, him being the, the true vine and us being the, the branches. Um, and let's see, it is uh, actually first in Romans. Um, Paul said that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here to the second part of salvation. But the first part, of course, is to be on the vine. To, Like you said earlier, by grace through faith, that is being born again and being baptized repenting of our sins um, you know Paul tells us that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead then we shall be saved that is the first part that John 15 that Jesus is talking about in John 15 when he says I am the vine and you are the branches he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them together and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And that is a paraphrase, of course, of John 15, what Jesus says. And if there's anything in the Gospels that shows that salvation is not something that is guaranteed forever no matter what once we uh you know confess jesus with our mouths and believe in our heart it's john 15 you know jesus talks about coming on to the vine which is salvation and this is what the early church believed and this is what they taught that the first stage of salvation is entering into the kingdom of god which is the same thing as being born again or uh, coming on to the vine, you know, becoming a branch onto the vine, being grafted into the cultivated olive tree that is spiritual Israel. And, you know, after that, we are clearly taught that we must produce fruit. You know, Jesus said that we must abide in him to bear much fruit. And without him, we can do nothing. And it doesn't mean without him we can do nothing as in, um, you know, you, you can't uh, hammer a nail or, you know, you can't draw a picture. He's talking about bearing fruit. He says that without him, you cannot bear fruit. But if you abide in him, then you will bear much fruit. And if anyone does not abide in him, then they will be, for all intents and paraphrasing, cast into the lake of fire. And so we become a branch on the vine, but again, there are conditions. There's no condition about becoming a branch. You know, that happens when we are saved. It's the first stage of salvation. 
but we can be cut off of the vine. He says that if we do not abide with him, we can be cut off of the vine. And, you know, John also writes um, that we pass from death to life. He says that we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. So we already enter into eternal life. We've already entered into eternal life right now. Even though we're living on this earth, we are citizens of heaven. The kingdom of heaven came with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about the millennium. I'm talking about the kingdom that came with Christ. This is what the early church believed. That we are to live live as if we are already in heaven with Christ. That we have passed from death to life. And if we are living like citizens of the kingdom, we'll, we will bear fruit. One of the biggest ways to bear fruit is by showing love to our bro- brethren. So, you know, that's one of the big things, but it's not the, the final thing. Because even there, John says, we know we've passed because we love our brother and but if we hate our brother then we are abiding in death and in that same letter in first john 5 he says this also he says he who has a son has life and he who does not have the son does not have life these things i have written to you who believe in the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So again, you know, the promise that we have already entered into eternal life is there. But there's still that condition that we need to continue to believe in Jesus Christ. The same as the early Christians say, the scriptures say as well. To believe in Christ means to obey Christ. See, the difference in the way we view faith today and belief in Christ today and the way that the early church viewed it is really quite simple. Today, we think that belief in Christ takes place all in the mind and at the most, the mind and the heart. But in the early church, To believe in Jesus Christ meant to obey him. It was, faith was an action word. I mean, it just, it was a word that just automatically, you know, came with fruit. If you had faith, the same as the book of James says, you know, faith without works is dead. And the reason why it's written so plainly there is because in the first century church, it was a given that if you had faith, then it would show in your works or your fruit. And I, I hope I'm not taking up the floor here, but uh, I, I hope I've kind of given a, a just of what the, the scriptures say, but also what the early church believed. Yeah, and we'll get into some quotes here in a little bit. Um, but you're right, you know, that, that word belief, um, it carries this, this notion of trust. It's not, a, it's not a word that means like a general sense of belief, like I believe the sky is blue. You don't trust in the sky. You know what I mean? Like a general belief is what the demons have. And the demons, they believe and they tremble with the demons. The demons aren't saved, right? It's not about just having this general belief, but acting upon that belief. Jesus says that if you love me, you will obey my commandments, right? And he gave us the list of commandments, not only in the Sermon on the Mount, but, you know, he gives us even the most, the two most important ones to love that, to love God with all thy heart, mind and soul and to love thy neighbor as thyself. That is what all the rest of them hang upon the law and the prophets. And without that, if you don't love Jesus, then that's going to show by your fruits. If you're not living through obedience in Christ, that obviously shows that you don't love him. And a lot of people will probably get mad at that. Oh, I love Jesus. I believe in him. Well, Christ is pretty much saying, if you did, you would prove it through through your obedience to my commandments. 
Yeah, and one of the um, one of we know that the the biggest kind of like um, proof of salvation is receiving the Holy Spirit. Um, you know that was one of the the ways that it is, in my opinion, one of the biggest ways that you know you are saved is you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Lord completely. The spirit of the living God completely changes your desires, your heart, your mind. And, um, you know, <laughs> there was actually in the early church, and, and I mean like the New Testament church, um, you know, in, in the book of, um, I want to say it's First Corinthians um it says, um, yep, it's First Corinthians. It says, um, and one through four, First Corinthians ten, one through four. It says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for the drink of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, can you imagine an Israelite wondering if he had actually passed through the Red Sea, whether he had actually been baptized into Moses? I mean, they would have known that. But, I mean, because it was an objective reality, they knew that. They knew beyond any doubt that they had been saved from Egypt. But that did not mean that they had made it to the promised land. So there in 1 Corinthians 10, I see the perfect example of salvation. You know, uh, just like the Israelites had been saved from Egypt, but they had not yet made it to the promised land. You know, they had to endure, right? They had to be obedient and endure through the wilderness in order to get to the promised land and we see when they did not obey and when they weren't obedient even Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land and it's the same with salvation when we are baptized originally you know when we enter into the kingdom of God we have been saved from the curse of sin and death you know we have entered from death to life our name has been written in the lamb's book of life but we have not yet reached the promised land you know what i mean and that's the same i mean it, it's one of the best analogies that i can give from the old testament of salvation and reaching that end goal you know jesus uh says to endure until the end and that's what we have to do. We have to endure until the end. Amen. Amen. Hey, Matthew, I know you probably got a whole lot to say as well. Do you want to chime in on here? Yes, sir. So, um, just to, to uh, add to what Jeremy was saying, um, I, I think that John chapter 15 is the best the best uh way to describe our relationship with jesus because that's what salvation is is the relationship with jesus um it, it's it's about well in jesus his words i mean if if you go through and read that whole chapter if you go through and read john chapter 14 15 and 16 Jesus says over and over and over and over and over and over again, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So how do we show Jesus we love him? By keeping his commandments. John chapter 15, as Jeremy pointed out a while ago, that he he showed the importance of abiding. Abiding uh, is the King James Version for remaining. If you are remaining on the vine, You've been put on the vine already. You can't remain on something that you ain't never been put on. You know what I mean? It remain very clearly implies that you have been put on it. And Jesus actually says that you are 
clean by the word that I spoke to you. So he shows that they're already on the vine. He's talking to folks that are already on the vine. That's why he says over and over again, abide, remain on the vine. And then he very clearly says, if you don't abide in me, then the branch that doesn't abide in me will be cut off and it'll wither and it'll be thrown into the fire. It's not the only time Jesus talks about bearing fruit. He talks about bearing fruit throughout all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and really through the whole New Testament, it talks about bearing fruit. And what is fruit to Jesus? And, you know, we can look at it as the fruit of the Spirit, which I believe that is um, applicable. Um, but specifically what Jesus says in context, uh, one of the times, one of the many times he talks about bearing fruit, uh, Jeremy kind of mentioned it a little while ago about the Sermon on the Mount. This is literally what Jesus says is the foundation to everything. I mean, foundation to our relationship with Him through foundation of the key, everything. I mean, this is, you know, you can't have a house that's going to stand through anything without a foundation, right? I mean, you just think about the importance of a foundation, right? In the, okay, the sermon on the, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in y'all's personal time, the listeners, I strongly encourage y'all to read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's also in, uh, uh, Luke as well. And it might be in Mark. I know in Luke, it's in, I think it's in, uh, chapter, uh, either chapter 6 or chapter 13. It, anyway, but, uh, Matthew's account, it, it's all put together here. And it says at the chapter 7, uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'll read the last half of the chapter. And the context of, of all this that I'm fixing to read is his commands in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is showing how Jeremy kind of showed the perspectives of the Sermon on the Mount a while ago. You know, you have people that believe that it's for a future time. You have people that believe that it's impossible it's to show us. It's like the Mosaic Law, like how, you know, it's to show us that we can't do it on our own, that we need you know that it's i mean it's all these different excuses to work around actually obeying what jesus said very clearly to obey um but i don't it doesn't matter what i say it doesn't matter what jeremy says it doesn't matter what any the preacher says it don't matter what anybody says but what jesus says because at the end of the day i'm not going to judge you i'm going to be judged myself and i'm going to stand before a righteous judge so i can't i can't all I could do is tell you what the judge says. And this is what the judge says. And he means what he says. And he said what he meant. And he's meant to be taken very seriously and very literally. As uh, Jeremy explained who the early Christians that we're talking about are. Um, first 300 years of Christianity. These are men that were personally discipled by the apostles. These are men like Polycarp and Ignatius that were personally discipled by John. There were people that were personally discipled by Paul or Peter you know these are and then and then uh, also the men that they discipled and then the men that, several generations away uh, spiritual generations from the apostles these are the early Christians we're talking about right so in like um, like Jeremy Stone mentioned a while ago that they, they were unanimously believed the same things and the things they disagreed on were very minor and they didn't divide over those things because they weren't uh, essential doctrines of the, like these like salvation was not something they divided over because they took it very simply like these these um these newer uh doctrines uh that uh, really started i mean we go on a whole rabbit trail on where they started from it started from the gnostics a lot of these newer doctrines and then um went in uh augustine brought them in um in the in the three hundred late three hundreds the, um, in the late 300s, early 400s, Augustine started bringing in a lot of these, the, after, uh, hanging out with the Gnostics for about a decade, he brought a lot of these, um, these doctrines we have today in the, within the church. Um, but none, the first 300 years, they, they didn't disagree, but I won't go any more on the rabbit trail on that. I'll, I'll read this in Matthew chapter seven. It says, um, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 
uh, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. There again, he talks about being cut down, thrown into the fire for not bearing good fruit. Uh, it says here, uh, immediately, this is the next verse. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He just got done in detail describing what the will of the Father is. The, ver- the chapter before he, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, um, May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Sermon on the Mount, these commands are literally... Uh, the, the laws of the kingdom of God. These are the things that we represent when, as ambassadors and citizens of the kingdom of God and as foreigners in the kingdom of this world. We represent and we're, we come from a different kingdom that's not of this world by living out Jesus' commands. Um, in this context, the Sermon on the Mount, the ones in the Sermon on the Mount, we are representing an, an ambassador for our kingdom, right? We are living out the will of the Father in the kingdom of this world as it is as his will is in the kingdom of heaven which is where we are from after we've been born again so that is the will of the father he just got done explaining that in detail the last two and a half chapters um uh but he who does the will of my father in heaven many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and I will declare it to them. I never knew you. Again, he never knew. It's, it goes back to relationship, right? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Practice lawlessness. Pra- you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, okay, so next verse. Therefore, in other words, because of what I just said, he's tying these two here together. Therefore, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine, and, and in the context, the sayings he's talking about are the teachings he literally just got them teaching, right? So that's um, forgiveness, um, not having a hate or lust in your heart, uh, not swearing oaths, loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, uh, not committing adultery, um, be, uh, staying married to one uh, one spouse. All these different things, all these teachings he gave. I mean it. Like I said, go through and read the Sermon on the Mount. All these, th- they're not optional. These things are, uh, foundational. Jesus is fixing to show us here. He says, so in other words, when from, from, because of what I just said, he says, therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them not will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his, at his teaching. For he taught them with one having authority and not as the scribes. So people were just as astonished in Jesus' day at the, the radical things that he was teaching as people are today. And these are not, we're, when we're talking about the commands of Jesus, we're, we're not talking about the old Mosaic law. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus very clearly shows the distinguishing difference. And even in John chapter 15, he also shows, I, I obey my commandments as I obey my father's commandments and in, in the Sermon on the Mount he constantly says you have heard it was said of old time this but I tell you this he, he uh, clarified at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 that he didn't come to replace it but to fulfill the law he fulfilled the old Mosaic law and he did he narrowed the way read the book of Hebrews it talks about a, the him coming from the order of Melchizedek and he um there was a changing of the law because of the new high priest and the changing wasn't a replacement it was a narrowing of the way 
right? Jesus said, you have heard it was said of old time to an eye for an eye, two for a two. But I say unto you not to resist any person. To, but when one strikes you on the one cheek, side of the cheek, turn to him the other also. You have heard it was said of old time to swear your oath before the Lord. But I say unto you, swear no oaths at all. He's, he's narrowing the way, right? These are the fruits in the context of chapter 7 of Matthew. He's talking about the people will know that they're going to know your mind because of your love, he says in another place, right? These are marked marking. This is what marked the early Christians. This is what, um, they, it says in the book of Acts chapter 17 that they turned the world upside down, right? In the next verse after that, it says that they were guilty of treason because they, they, um, they were, they were guilty of treason against Caesar because their allegiance to was to a different king named Jesus. It's, it's it all goes back to these commandments, right? Not swearing oaths, oaths that includes allegiance. That it's I mean it's all tied in. It's kingdom. It's all about the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about salvation a handful of times, but he talked about the kingdom of God almost a hundred times throughout the Gospels. It was very important in the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he called it, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Right, he said, yeah. repent. Yeah, that's that's what it's about. It's about the kingdom. It's it's you know, and see when you. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to some of these scriptures here. I'm just gonna start reading some scriptures because yeah, um, I want you to just take what I say because it really don't matter what I say. I'm just gonna start reading these scriptures. I just want the listeners to really just um, put aside your preconceptions. Put aside. You know, I didn't grow up. Um, I didn't grow up uh, seeing these things this way. Um, there took it. There, there was a lot of pruning branches that had to be pruned off, um, as it talks about in John chapter fifteen. I, a lot of, and I'm I, I by no means have everything figured out. And I'm I could I could learn some things tonight. I, you've got to come across these. You've got to come to the to Jesus's word with a teachable heart. And with a humble heart and realize that this is what I had to come to and realize. Can y'all still hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I went into a different app on my phone so I could look at some notes. I didn't know if it cut out or not. But no, you're um, good. While, while you look for those real quick, do you mind if I read uh, Hebrews chapter 6 real quick? Because it's got, it's got everything that we've been talking about and has so much meat and it's such a debated for some reason it's debated and i think it's because it's scary to those who um hold on to the modern tradition modern traditional belief that you know and once saved always saved and again all these topics whether it's um you know obedience and salvation and uh you know it, it all leads into all these other hot topics such as you know predestination and theistic determinism and free will uh, all these different things but hebrews chapter six i feel like is this it's this one chapter that, uh, well, not the only one, but it, it makes it clear as day and really hits the whole thing home because it is specifically talking to believers. And what is written cannot be denied. And those who deny it, I feel like, are denying it because they are they don't want to let go of... They, 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 can't, they can't reconcile it with what they believe now, if that makes sense. So, Hebrews chapter 6 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of the faith toward god and of the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands and of, re of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and this will do uh, and this will we do if god permit for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the holy ghost which means right there just that right there you were once born again you cannot be a partaker of the holy ghost without being born again right. this is an and it says, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars, that's their fruit they don't bear fruit they born thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned so he goes on crystal clear 
first to quit, but he goes on to, you know, like encourage you to keep going uh, through all the trials and tribulations or everything. To have your patience as Abraham once did, because he didn't see the promise, but he patiently waited for that. And he says, but he says, but beloved, we are persuaded by better things of you and things that accompany salvation through we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name. And that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. Yeah, there, if I can chime in really quick, there are two scriptures that sum up um, each side of this. And... The first one is 2 Timothy 2.12, where it says, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And then in uh, back to Hebrews, going right along with what you just read, Jeremy, it says in Hebrews 10.26, it says, If we sin willfully, after we have received the love of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. Yep. It, yep and, those are some uncomfortable verses. Absolutely. And I, I'm fixing to read some Hebrews here in a minute. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3. The book of Hebrews, the whole book is... <laughs> you, you turn the page every chapter, it reads like that. I mean, it's... Like, it's, uh, it's very sobering and uh it's it's talking about a continual willful um you've made peace with your sin like you that's why when paul goes through and talks about the sins that will not inherit the kingdom of god he's talking about sin the sins he lists are um lifestyle sins right uh, he lists uh what um adultery uh, you know, fornication, drunkenness, gluttony, homosexuality, witchcraft. These are sins that they, people wake up every day. They've made peace with it. They know they're going to do it and they're okay with it. They've sheared their conscience. They, they've continually, um, that, in fact, I'm just going to read the Hebrews chapter three now because that kind of goes right into what, uh, that it, it explains it very well. It, um, the continual making peace with your sin, hardening of your heart, right? Um, it says here uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse, uh, we'll read like 12 through 19. Uh, Take heed, brethren, lest their brethren, he's talking to brethren, he's talking to believers, people who are on the vine. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if, that's a conditional statement, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did pro provoke, provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved forty years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So he, that's, you know, like I said. It, well, they started off believing, right? That's how they got there in the yeah. first place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they had that baptism, and they yeah. were risking they went through the water. Right. But they didn't continue in belief. I can think of three New Testament examples of the same thing. Aquila, his wife Priscilla, and Simon Magus. And I'm sure people will hear that and say, Simon Magus, how is he a Christian? Well, it shows in the Bible that he was. The early Christians believed he was. It was, you know, it was, no one even questioned that Simon Magus had 
been saved initially because he had believed and he had received a proper Christian baptism. But then a short time later, what happened? Yeah, he did the same thing that Aquila and Priscilla did as far as hardening their heart. You know, they stole, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And just like Jeremy read in Hebrews 6 and I read in Hebrews 10, um, you know, they received the wrath of God. You know, they, they fell dead. Simon Magus, um, you know, some people will say uh, that he must not have been saved at all because of what he did. But although Peter strongly rebuked him when he asked Peter to sell him the power to bestow the Holy Spirit, Peter rebuked him, but he did not say to him, you were never really saved to begin with or else you would not have asked me to do this. No, there was no question about the fact that Simon had actually been saved initially, put on the vine. But that did not mean that he was assured of salvation forever. Because in fact, later, he totally turned away from Christ. So, you know, in short, the early Christians believed that there was an assurance of salvation as far as the first stage, but not assurance from the time they were put on the vine until their death. They had to endure and continue in the love of the truth until their death. Yeah, Judas is another good example. I mean, it, in Matthew chapter 10, he was listed as one of the ones that Jesus sent out doing miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, it, you don't have to look very far to see what happened with Judas. So, I mean, it's it, holding holding fast, right? Uh, he that endures till the end, the same will be saved. Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 10. He says it in Matthew 24. He says it throughout. He says it again the same uh the same theme here uh in in uh, revelation chapter 2 these are to the churches the letters to the churches the churches being believers brothers uh right it says in uh, chapter 3 revelations into the into the angel of the church in sardis right these things uh says he who has the seven spirits of god and the seven stars i know your works that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Listen here. He says here, he that overcomes to all seven churches. Out of seven out of seven churches, he says, he who overcomes. The same, he who endures to the end. He who hold fast, overcome, right? He says here in verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name. Oh, let me turn the page. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If, if he's threatening to blot out our names out of the book of life, our names are written in the book of life at some point in time. If he's threatening to blot it out of the book. And if people say, well, he, if you just go by what he says, he didn't actually say he would blot it out. Well, go back, go to read uh, chapter 22, Revelation. That's the beginning of the book of Revelation. Go to the end of the book, the very last verses here in 19. It literally says that. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And if, for those who don't know what the book of life is, I'm just going to read a, a very small uh, part here. And I think it's uh, Revelation 20. Yep, here it is, verses, uh, verse 11. Then I, This is the great white throne judgment, the final judgment, right? At the very end of everything. Then I, It just shows you what the book of life is. Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, who's, uh, from whose face the earth and the heaven 
uh, fled away, and there were found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the dead and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then dead and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if your name's not in the book of life, Scripture is very clear out there in Revelation 20, the lake of fire. Because here's the thing, y'all. So this is this is important to understand with salvation. We've been talking a lot about the second phase and and um and re- and remaining on the vine, but we have to get on the vine. I, I, a lot of people, this is preached a lot in churches, so a lot of people know this. But for those who don't, I think it's equally important to understand how to get on the vine. We have to be born again jesus says right we can't even see the kingdom if we're not born again right it says he said that we have to deny ourselves take up our cross daily and follow him we have to die to ourselves as paul puts it to be born again to have a new birth we have to die to our old life of sin right it's dead that's uh, jesus said that before him then our father is the devil we so we have to die to ourselves paul said um old things have passed away hey, behold all things have become new right we have to die to ourselves so that we could be have a new birth be born again and now god is our father we have a new father right and it's exchange life our sinful life is nailed on the cross and it's crucified with jesus and he gives us his righteous life and through the power of the holy spirit we can live righteously that mean we're going to get it right every time then mean we're going to we're going to be perfect in, in everything we do but we if we have the power of the living god living inside of us we re- really don't have any excuse to to not do right i mean it doesn't mean we're going to get it right every time as long as we're living in this flesh until jesus comes back and gives us that new body we're gonna mess up sometimes you can ask anybody that's close to me you ask my wife and she'll tell you i it's not a cop-out answer i'm not using it as an answer like to excuse my, my sin i'm just saying i'm not perfect i mess up but we as first john chapter one and two says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins we have an advocate with the father jesus the righteous right to read first john is it's a very it, we have to balance this with with um scriptures like first john and and we have to come in in repentance and i mean it, jesus said repent and hold fast right so look at some of these other things i'm going to read a couple of these other scriptures here so it's it's a so look at these parables right i i'm just gonna read i'm just gonna read two parables okay um but look at all the kingdom parables most of the kingdom parables have the same message and all of the kingdom parables are addressed to people in the kingdom of god people that are saved people that are on the vine he ain't talking to the kingdom of the world he said the kingdom of god is like and then he gives the example right so here's one of them uh this is in uh, luke chapter 13 he spake also this parable a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none then said he unto the dresser of the vin- of his vineyard behold these three years I, I i come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none cut it down why cumbereth it the ground and he answering said unto him lord let it alone this year also till i i shall dig about it and dung it to basically water fertilize it um it's the king james of you know fertilizing it and if it bear fruit well if it bear fruit bear fruit well and if not then after that shall cut it uh, thou shall cut it down strap and then he says here later on and uh it says strive to enter in the stri- in the same chapter a strive to enter in at the straight gate for many this is this is the parable of um that jesus also taught you know he talks about the narrow gate the broad gate we just read that in matthew 7 this is luke's account here strive to enter in at the straight gate 
For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door to, and shut to the door and ye begin to stand without and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall say and answer and say unto you, I know uh, you not whence ye are. And sh uh, then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drank in thy presence and thou hast taught in thy streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, ye, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. He says another place, I believe it's in Luke, where he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? So it's, it's the same. The same so here's the other parable I was going to share. Um, and then I'll, I'll, uh, Let's see. I've got these early um, church quotes um, that go right along with it whenever you finish. Okay, I was just going to read this last little parable and then uh, turn it over. Uh, I mean, I there, there's literally, there's 80, there's over 80 scriptures that I know just, that I know just that I can, I can share. I mean, that they, they say the same thing. I mean, it's not like just one or two you know cherry pick scriptures here and there right i mean it it's it is a a obedient love faithful relationship with jesus right and actually i i said i said um well i'm gonna share i'm gonna share this one here this this one is this one's from paul okay this is romans 11 we go into a lot of other stuff and how what how this relates to you know the jews and gentiles but what i want to draw out of this is uh the point of the of what we're talking about tonight. This is in Romans chapter eleven. Um, it says, uh, "And if some of the branch, he's basically saying he's basically saying the same thing Jesus said, but he's using it um, to prove some points um, and clear some things up between the Jews and the Gentiles. But he's saying the same thing Jesus said in John chapter fifteen. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree." were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree boast not against the branches but if thou boast thou bearest not the root but the root thee thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in well because of unbelief they were broken off and thou standest by faith be not high minded but fear and here it is for if God spared not the natural branches take heed lest he also spare not thee and you can keep going on and on and it's uh, Ephesians chapter 2 the, uh, we are saved by grace through faith unto good to doing good works I, I mean keep things in context I mean we can't just cherry pick some of these passages out and make them say whatever we wanted to say we've got to go on and read we read the rest of Ephesians chapter 2 right I mean read the whole thing right um, this is the this is the one I was going to give and then I'll this is the, the last parable I was going to give and then I'll I'll turn it over here. Uh, this is in, um, I think, Matthew chapter 13. Let's see. Matthew, yep, here it is. Uh, again, the kingdom of heaven is like, and so again, the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about people in the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's, it's not very hard to get in the kingdom of heaven. It's a gift. It's a free gift. We can't do it on our own. We cannot work or do anything but what Jesus has done for us, right? We, by grace, by God's grace, and through our faith in Jesus, we die to ourselves. We repent. We change of allegiances from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God and to Jesus as King. Right? The early Christians would renounce their allegiances to this world, the kingdom of this world, the countries they lived in, and they would give their allegiance to Jesus as King and the kingdom of God. Right? With that born again, right? It's many people could come in right but this is what he says here in uh, matthew 13 47 through 50 again the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full they drew to shore, uh, shore to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels but cast the bad away so shall it be at the end of the world the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
the whole chapter of Matthew 13 is full of those kind of parables. The sower and the seed, right? Uh, only one of the four, they were all, there was another kingdom parable. They all had the gospel sown into it. The soil, only one of them bared fruit. And sur- I mean, just, we could go on and on all night, literally. Once you understand this in the context of the scriptures, and you understand that how you get on to the vine through, by God's grace, through, through our faith in Him, and confessing Him with Lord, that surrendering everything to Him, then we have to have that obedient, faithful relationship. It's not a checklist. It's not something that we did this today, we didn't do that. It, it's, Paul relates it to marriage, right? He relates it to, he uses a lot of analogies, It's but they're all relationship analogies. It's, you know, it's endurance to the end. It's, uh, you know, he, he said, if I, if you confess me among men, I'll confess you among my father. If you deny me among men, I'll deny you among my father. He says that in all the gospels. I don't know about John, but I know he does Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 10, I know he does. He says, uh, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. He who loses life for my sake, the same will find it. He, I mean, it's he who endures till the end, the same will be saved. It's, it's a constant. It is everywhere. It's literally everywhere. And that's, and that's what I like about the early church fathers so much is that in their writings, they clear that I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from, from Jeremy Anderson to read all those quotes because the early church father does so much. They do so much justice in explaining everything that we're talking about in the clearest form and they take the bible in its entire context instead of just new testament or here's one verse they take the whole bible in its context to give you exactly what god has been saying throughout the whole narrative yeah it's nothing new and they highlight what's already there yeah so let's hear it bud let's hear what they got to say so that we can get a clear picture of uh of everything that we uh are trying to digest tonight Absolutely, and you'll hear scripture all throughout, woven in throughout the anti-Nicene fathers here. Um, and I, I'm going to start with volume one, and this is on page 51, and it's a quote from Ignatius, who who lived during the time of Acts. I mean, Ignatius was a disciple of the Apostle John, and he was born just a, a couple of years after the death of Christ in 35 AD and his quote says here that he God may both hear you and perceive by your works that you are indeed the members of his son and then on page 53 he says faith cannot do the works of unbelief nor unbelief the works of faith the tree is made manifest by its fruit. So those who profess themselves to be Christians will be recognized by their conduct. And then we have Polycarp, who was also a disciple of the Apostle John, who lived not far from the time he lived the same time as Ignatius but he wasn't quite as old as Ignatius Um, he was born around 69 AD from 69 AD to 156 AD but Polycarp said this he said he who raised him talking about Jesus up from the dead will also raise us up if we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness. And that's also from the Anti Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, page 33. And we've got Barnabas, the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, and Barnabas was from around AD 70 to 100. Um, and he says, The way of light then is as follows. If anyone desires to travel to the appointed place, he must be zealous in his works. And that's from the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, page 148. He then says, The whole pastime of your faith will profit you nothing, unless now, in this wicked time, we also withstand coming sources of danger 
you have to understand that when these things were written, the church was being persecuted. These people were being killed for their faith unless they denied Jesus Christ. And of course, if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know these men loved Christ unto the death. They would rather die than deny their Lord. Even though they had they never... Tortured. Yes! Even though they had never, you know, physically seen him the way, you know, the apostles did or, or you know, those who lived the same time Jesus did, these men were just as faithful, if not more. Jesus said, you know, you have seen me and you believe, but blessed are they who have not seen me and believe. And it is this type of faith that we are going to have to have in the last days because here in America unfortunately I think we've been hindered um, you know the church over in the Middle East and in China and in places where they are being you know truly persecuted for their faith the way that the early Christians were they are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit like we can only read about. That, that persecution comes with power. We see it in the New Testament. We see it in the Anti-Nicene Church. And we will see it again in the End Times Church. You know, I know that this isn't what tonight's program is about, but... The power of the Holy Spirit that we see in the book of Revelation that the two witnesses have, you know, there are, you know, many different beliefs about the two witnesses, but regardless to whether you believe like me that the two witnesses are representative of two groups of the church, or you believe they are two Old Testament prophets come back, regardless to what you believe. The power of the Holy Spirit is the same, and it's right there in black and white in Revelation chapter 11. And if we do not become prepared now, before that persecution comes, to love not our lives, even unto the death, then we are going to fall away. And we are going to accept the mark of the beast and give away our eternal salvation. I mean, we're going to be just like, you know, Esau. We're going to give away our birthright for a bowl of stew. And we have got to be sober and be vigilant now so that when that time comes, we will be close enough with Christ, indwelled enough with the Holy Spirit, that we will not fall away and we will be willing to die if that's what it takes. The early Christians definitely were. I know I stopped in the middle of a quote here, but it says, Take heed, lest resting at our ease, at those who are the called, we fall asleep in our sins. For then the wicked prince, acquiring power over us, will thrust us away from the kingdom of God. And you should pay attention to this all the more, my brothers, when you reflect on and see that after such great signs and wonders had been performed in Israel, they were still abandoned. Let us beware lest we be found to be, as it is written, the many who are called, but not the few who are chosen. And that's the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, page 139. Clement of Rome said in the first century, we are justified by our works and not our words. I love that. I absolutely love that. We're justified by our works and not our words. And that's Christ also... Yeah, I, I was just going to say that's Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, page 13, for anybody who wanted to know... But yeah, Christ himself said, you know, um, would their would their lips say praise me, but their heart is far from me. Amen. 
you know it's the same it's essentially the same exact thing your your lips can say many things and proclaim many things but your heart is based on the way that you act and the way that you conduct and live your life that's what shows the true character of your heart absolutely i've got one more quote i'd like to read and then i'll turn it back over to you guys completely but this one is really really good it's from second clement and it was written around ad 150 and he says this he says this then is our reward if we will confess him by whom we have been saved but in what way will we confess him we confess him by doing what he says not transgressing his commandments and honoring him not only with our lips but with all our heart and all our mind let us then not only call him lord for that will not save us and he's going he's going back on what jesus said not everybody who says lord lord but he says let us then not only call him lord for that will not save us for he says not everyone who says to me lord lord will be saved but he that works righteousness for that reason brethren let us confess him by our works by loving one another and that's the anti-nicene fathers volume 7 page 518. yeah see that's one of the things that uh something that comes to mind instantly is when paul uses i mean when people use paul to say well if you confess your lips that jesus is lord and you, and you believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead that you will be saved but if you take that out of the context of what christ said and all the other things that um come to attribute what salvation is all about then you would think to yourself like so many christians do that just because you confess them with your lips that you're saved yeah, absolutely that's why i wanted to read that quote because i think it sums it up perfectly you know how do we confess him not with our works but i mean not with our words with our works yeah. Yeah, according to james look at james chapter two like uh i know we're we're cutting cutting down on time but just the listeners read the read chapter two of james in your own time it he he says it like this he says i'll show my my faith by my works it's uh it it's you know the devil paints this false dichotomy of it's where you know you have uh the catholic church that says that says that we we earn our way right you know this is what people believe they believe it's either one or the other we either it's just by grace or it's just by faith or it's just by grace by faith or it's predestination or whatever you know it, it's uh it or it's we earn it right like you know we uh do this this then the other. it's it's a false dichotomy right and that's what the devil wants to do in so many ways he has all kinds of false dichotomy this is just one example but it's 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 both i mean it's it's in the context of scripture i mean it's really not both but it is you know it, it's we get on the vine and then we remain on the vine you know it's it, it's um that's it's that's good that's thank you for reading those that that's really good it shows it shows that it, it was consistent throughout the first couple centuries. I mean, it really, that, that's what they all said. I mean, that, we read a very small handful of, of these quotes and these scriptures, but... Yeah, right. Clement of Alexandria, 215 AD, says this, It's neither the faith, nor the love, nor the hope, nor the endurance of only one day. Rather, it is he that endures... To the end, will be saved. Yep. That's good. Amen. Amen. And there you go. You know that that's everything that they have said is, again, not one verse here or there, but taking the entirety of Scripture, taking the entire context of the whole Bible, the whole narrative, to give the, the solid, sound doctrine in which they were taught by the apostles. That's what they were taught. Like I, I always tell people. You're not going to argue with me whether it's once saved, always saved. Let me tell you what the early church fathers say who who literally were taught by the apostles themselves, who were taught by Christ. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because I understand how people get, uh, you know, how, how people um, take verses and 
scripture and kind of apply this, you know, where, where, where it's kind of hard to understand. So they apply their own lens. You know, if you ever have a question about what it means, what does God mean? Go to the early church fathers. They'll tell you what it means. In, On almost in every subject, honestly, yeah. but they go up from free will to, uh, you know, there's free will, uh, original sin, um, predestination, all these different things. Literally all the ones that we are, are like hotly debated today, they talked about. Yeah, and a good source, to, if y'all want to know more about what they believe, uh, David Perso, um, and Scroll Publishing, it, it's, it's, there's tons of videos on YouTube, Scroll Publishing, um, the historicfaith.com. Yeah, the, well, the Scroll Publishing is free though, but yeah, Historic Faith is even more resource. Uh, I think that's. You like, don't have the money. They have a. Uh, they'll they'll let you take the entire thing for free. Yeah, they will. Yeah, they, they definitely are not in it for the money. They're definitely in it for for um, uh, edifying the body of Christ. But that scroll publisher, uh, a good a good one to start it is uh, what the early Christians believed about the two kingdoms. What the early Christians believed about the kingdom parables. He goes through and, and talks about the kingdom parables. That, and, and that addresses a lot of stuff we're talking about tonight, the kingdom parables. This is, uh, this is what I had to come to with a lot of these things is I, when I was, when I came to Jesus's words, the red letters, really all the scripture, cause it's all inspired by God is I, if I came to something that Jesus said that went against what I believed from what I was brought up, raised believing, what I was, you know, what makes me feel comfortable, whatever the preconception is, whatever the lens. Um, if, if what Jesus said goes against what I believe, I'm now wrong and Jesus is right every time. And we have to come to his words with that, that, um, teachability, that being, uh, that, that submission to him that he, if G is, is Jesus really Lord or are we the Lord of our life? Right? What, what we say, is that really true? Or is what, if, if we come up on something that he says in context, not, not pulled out of context, but in context of scripture, if it says it very clearly, like these things that we read tonight, is, is what Jesus says true or is what we believe true? Cause we're not going to be, we're, we're going to be just on based on what he said, not what we think he said. Yeah. And the problem is people do not come to it like a little child. Jesus says we have to become like little children because children are teachable. They have a teachable heart. Mm, that's good. Yeah, children don't really come into it with a preconceived notion. But nowadays we've been saturated with seminar seminaries and all these theologians, you know what I mean? We've gotten really far in the modern day, especially the Western church, really far from what the ancient faith really was and what it is. And most of the things that we believe now or that, that people perpetuate now, and I'm going to just straight up say it. Calvinism, most of those doctrines within Calvinism comes from Gnosticism. And the early church fathers speak about those things. Very. And they tell you where they come from. And I think it's very important for people to put down there. Their both pride Calvin and, and Luther and, were Augustinian you know, their, monks. Yeah. They were. Yeah, true. they got their doctrines from Augustine. That's right. And Augustine, like, like Matthew said earlier, was a Manichaean for 10 years. You know? And But his early stuff, like Bill Baker said... His early stuff was lined up with the early church fathers pretty well, but his later stuff, uh, in the early 400 AD, he just did a complete 180. And I and think what we read tonight and what we saw tonight about how it's not about being faithful for a day or for half your life, you, know, you yeah. have to endure in the faith until the end. Yes, yeah. he did. Endure to the end. He that endures to the end, the same will be saved. That's. And we will be judged by our works according to Christ. Yeah, that's right. It All is, right, Brian. I know you're over there somewhere. <laughs> I think. Oh, maybe not. All right, boys. Well, he's going to have to edit all of this. And we're at about an hour and a half. So I'd really like to have you guys on for probably a part two, three, four, and five. Because there's so much to talk about, especially within the early church fathers and we can touch on certain doctrines next time and stuff like that and i think that'd be great but i really appreciate having you boys on and i love you guys and uh we'll definitely have to do this again 
Absolutely, man. I surely enjoyed it. I, I don't think anyone will be able to listen to this episode tonight with the scriptures and the early church quotes and honestly um, give any kind of argument that will disprove biblical salvation, which is what we went over tonight. Yep. Well, this, Amen. This, this is the thing. Um, this this was the last thing um, that I was going to say was that um, these things, most of these scriptures you read tonight are so clear that you have to have help to misunderstand them. Amen. And, but there's a lot of help to misunderstand like that. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of help to misunderstand these very clear scriptures that just speak for themselves, you know. Um, yeah. Thank yeah, y'all. You got to read into it. You got to read into it for sure. Dude, for sure. Thank y'all. For Thank you for having us, man. Not a problem, guys. I love you, boys, and we'll catch up pretty soon here. I love All you guys, right. too. Yo. All right. God bless. All right. Grace and peace, guys.